I'm delighted to be here to chair this uh, afternoon's event to talk about multiples, which is uh, an amazing and weird thing, um, which Adam, sitting to my left, is responsible for. Um, just very quick introductions uh, to Adam and Tash, Adam Thurwell and Tash Orr, who are both brilliant novelists, but they're not really going to be here talking about noveling exactly. Um, they're going to be talking about their their work on the Multiples uh, project, the Multiples book. We're particularly grateful that they were able to come here because all of the trains were cancelled this morning and through some great resourceful, intrepid uh, manoeuvres of some kind, they walked from London. <laughs> they didn't literally walk from London, but Catherine in particular I think was impressed because Catherine, after 12 years of running summer school, does not immediately associate uh, writers with independence and <laughs> ability, to, ability to function on their own. Um, and so I think Catherine was anticipating people phoning her going, I, I don't understand. There isn't a train. I don't know what to do. I'm sitting there. <laughs> Liverpool Street Station, I sat down and wept. Um, so we're particularly grateful they, they were able to make it up today in spite of the lightning that struck Manning Tree, I think is what it was. Um, one thing I will also say is that one of the reasons they should be very grateful that they came up here is that on the train, uh, the long list for the booker this year was announced, and Tash is on that long list. Um, which, which should come as no surprise to anyone, not only because he's a brilliant novelist, and I've heard this new book, which I have not yet read, is wonderful, but also because this is, in fact, the second year in a row that someone discovered they were on the long list of the book on their train up to summer school. So this is now something which we're going to use to sell summer school. But if you want a place on the book along list, all you have to do is book a train, or even if the train doesn't turns out not to exist, um, a train up to summer school on just the right day. Um, Adam is a novelist, as I said, the author of... It is, uh, I was going to say, say how many novels there are, but I don't know which of them are novels Two. anymore. Two. Two things which are novels, properly. Something which is Miss Herbert, and I don't know what it is, but it is amazing. Um, it's not quite a novel, but it's not quite anything, but it's an amazing thing. Um, and Kapow, which is a new uh, experimental book, which is also not quite one thing. Um, Adam was also on the 2003 Granter Best Young British Novelists, and he was such a young British novelist in 2003 that he was even still a young novelist by 2013, when he, when he is now an, old, an older young British novelist. Um, he made the list uh, on two occasions. We have a couple of Granter, other Granter youngsters in the room today, part of that family. Um, and Tash Orr over there has now published, just published his third novel, the first of which, The Harmony Salt Factory, won the Whitbread Book Award, uh, first novel uh, prize in, in some year, you know, one of those years, um, in, in a year in the past. Um, and it's, a, it's an absolutely glorious novel, which I commend to you. But as I say, we're not going to be talking about uh, their novels. We're going to be talking about multiples. Um, and I'm going to ask Adam to start by just explaining what the hell this thing is. You started with, as you say in the introduction, you start with a hypothesis and an experiment. So what is the hypothesis that, that this was, thing that was, is meant to be? Uh, yeah, that was, that was the organised way of putting it. Um, so what we've ended up with, is, um, this actually makes it look far more normal an object than it really is. Um, it looks very tidy when it's bad. It looks very tidy. That <laughs> it's not there tidy. Are, um, 12 stories in here, uh, which all went through basically like, I suppose it was like the game of Chinese whispers. So we ended up with 61 versions of 12 stories uh, in all. Um, so the hypothesis was that I'd always been, I've, I've always been interested in translation for as long as I've been interested in literature, basically. And um, one of the things that I've always been intrigued by is if when you're reading a book or in the history of the novel, Style is the thing that everyone is often talking about. Style and form are the kind of ways in which, uh, like the kind of the great histories of the novel are written. Um, so you know, people praise Proust because of the sentence structure or the, what he has done to the form of the novel. And yet, at the same time, everyone agrees on this truism that style doesn't translate. And so, then the final kind of bit of my problem was. But on the other hand, no one only reads novels in their own language. That you'd be considered insane if you said, "Well, because I, I don't read French, I don't read Zola, or I don't read Proust." Um, so there seemed to me the, to be the publishers would have you believe. <laughs> but this is another question. Um, yes. So there seemed to me a problem in the way that either we were thinking about style or the way we were thinking about translation. That somehow these two things had to match up because otherwise the idea of the history of the novel being an international thing couldn't be true. 
Um, so that was, so basically the hypothesis was the style must be translatable. That was the kind of hypothesis. So, um, or to kind of, in another way, I think often when I read kind of theories of translation, I'm always struck by how sort of there's almost a glamour of pessimism in them, that there's a sort of, uh, the, the philosophy behind them is that in some way language is such a kind of, each language has such an inner structure that there will be no possible way really for these things to cross over, which again, I think just on a purely kind of pragmatic level, I've never believed to be true either, that, you know, it's, that communication is just about still possible. So the hypothesis was, let's make translation an optimistic art form rather than a pessimistic one. Um, but then to subject this optimistic... Take note. Um, <laughs> um, but then to subject the optimistic um, hypothesis to as sort of terrible a test as I could think of. Um, and so what we came up with was uh, that you would... My initial idea, I have to say, was that it would be just one story that would go through maybe five iterations, that it was just going to be a little jeu d'esprit that might come out in a magazine somewhere. I didn't intend to create this vast monster of a book, um, uh, which happened because simply uh, I know the people at McSweeney's and I was mentioning that I had this vague scheme that one day I might quite like to do. And then suddenly two weeks later, what I say is never do a deal over Skype is my, is my own. Because if you have a bad Skype connection, uh, you will be unable to talk back when people are telling you what they want you to do. And suddenly um, you have therefore agreed to producing 70,000 words. Um, so um, what we therefore chose was, if we just start with one story. So there was, say, a story in Dutch by a contemporary writer called A.L. Schneiders. Uh, Lydia Davis then had translated that into English. Um, and so what I wanted to do was keep going, partly because it was going to be an issue of McSweeney's, which is this American history magazine. We had to, my initial idea had been that we could just roll through different languages and there was no reason why English should be privileged, but in the interest of the McSweeney's subscriber who might not really like to receive a book that they couldn't read. Um, we therefore weighted the thing so that it kept on going pretty much in and out of English. Uh, so English was the sort of base language. Um, and then my final rule of this mad game was that, uh, and I certainly wasn't expecting to have to present this project, therefore, to an audience of professional translators. The idea was that professional translators would be excluded from the project. Um, because Adam doesn't like translators. Because I don't like translators. <laughs> he thinks we're stupid. Um, and the reason... I'm editorialising slightly, obviously. <laughs> and the reason for that yeah, was because I didn't want to use Danny. Um, uh, the, the reason for this was to put pressure on the style idea, because what I wanted was to take, I was kind of interested in this idea that all writers, if they're very good, will have developed their own style that they kind of can't help but write in. Um, and so I wanted to see what would happen if kind of these people who were apparently, theoretically, inescapably stylish, uh, were then constantly kind of remaking this object. And also I quite like the idea of adding a sort of amateur aspect to it, again, to kind of create as much mayhem as possible. So people's language skills wildly varied. So some people were genuinely bilingual. Other people lied to me, and it turned out they just used Google Translate for most of it. <laughs> um, so, but that was all kind of part of the game. Um, Tash, can I ask you then, as a stylish person, clearly a stylish person, um, was this then did you feel the sort of pressure that you have your own style as a writer and what Adam was asking you to do was somehow subsume this and try and see whether you could sustain a style which existed which was not your own? No, I mean not, no, certainly not at, at the outset because I, I still have the very geek I, I, I call it a, a geeky approach to translation so when something comes to me as translation I'm, you know, I have the sort of the, the translator's sort of respect for the text and I, I, I didn't take, I mean I didn't feel I could take as many liberties as I, I felt the project required me to, to do. So what I, I felt what was... What kind of instruction did you? I mean, what kind of, well, that's the other thing. What kind of brief did, did Adam give you? Well, absolutely none at all. I mean, that's, that's why <laughs> it was, I think, one of the crazy rules that you didn't, you haven't mentioned. One of my, yeah, one of my rules, were, I think the rule was <laughs> that people were instructed to do anything that they thought would be an equivalent story in the new language. So that could well, that mean... wasn't even what I got. <laughs> <laughs> I was just told... You, were you briefed on Skype by any chance? <laughs> no, I wasn't. I, I, um, 
Adam was on holiday um, <laughs> in the south of France, as it happened. So I was by a swimming pool and I was writing some angry emails. And, um, I was just told, here's something you have to produce. Produce a good translation, whatever that means. Now, the other thing that I think you haven't yet pointed out is that all I received and all every translator received was the text of a story. You, weren't, you were told who had translated it before you, so we were all down the chain. We were moving our way oh, yeah, So the only chain. the first translator in each chain saw the literal original. So, yeah. so you didn't know what was happening upstream, as I it had, were. You, you only get you know, just a few metres upstream. Yeah. So I only saw Ma Tien's story. I know he had translated... Should we just explain the sequence that Tash yes. did? Yeah. So I'll put something up. Uh, Tash is... So just to explain, there was an Italian story by Pontigia, which we chose, that Zadie Smith translated from Italian into English, that then the Chinese writer Ma Jian translated from English into Chinese, and so Tash therefore saw a translation of a translation. Uh, and so I asked him to put Ma Jian's Chinese back into English. However, I didn't... I wasn't privy to Zadie's translation, yeah. nor, the nor the Italian original. I had no circumstances, I had no surrounding circumstances in which to situate my own translation, which is, I think, the natural, the, I think the, the natural translator's instinct is to try and gather as many bits of information as possible so that you can situate this story in its historical context, in its cultural context, and try and build a picture of what's going on in the person's mind, or the, the, the writer's mind, or the... Although these things, I think, when you remove them, um, force you. I think they force you to to think about what you're doing in a totally different way. And so, my my first day, um, I was just sort of seized by this panic, just looking at this thing, thinking, "Well, you know, I I have this thing to translate, but I mean, how do I do? I mean, um, we'll get into the specifics slightly later on. Um, but I think there's also a time element because it was not. This is something that I think, as all of you. Uh, realize this was something which we knew was going to be published was going to be published soon and I came very far down the chain and what happens is the original people obviously they want to take care as much care as possible over their translation so they'll they'll take six months so the next person and then you're the one has being pressed against the deadline is it? <laughs> three months and then the one downstream I has think you've had two weeks it was I had a, ten days it was a long time <laughs> I ten, ten whole days, days. Ten whole days about? after negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that so so essentially it was blind translation, um, which and, and contextless, contextless, totally contextless. And so you're always having to second guess what the writer before you has done to the to the translation before that. It, it, the whole thing is is asking questions about the stability of what we consider originals, which we pretend are stable things, and quite clearly. They are not, which in a sense I would have thought is the kind of thing that might make writers conditions. Kind of one of my favourite um, examples of how this got um, destroyed was that uh, the, the original has a um, epigraph um, from Rodolfo Wilcock, J. Rodolfo Wilcock, um, and somehow via therefore, um, because Tash didn't know about this writer, and I don't think nor did Margen, so we then finish with an epigraph from J.R. Wade Cook, which I really like. Yes. But the entire author changes. Um, well, I mean, uh, <laughs> which I'm sorry for Mr. Wilcock, but, um, but, but the trans 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 I'm sorry for Mr. Wilcock, but stuff happens. Yeah. And, you know. But you know, the, I mean, the, the Chinese and other translators, amongst you will know that there, there is a instantly a problem with phonetics. You know, yeah. phonetical translations of Asian names, unless you know the circumstances, which I didn't know. I did, had no idea. I'm what not criticizing. <laughs> I'm, I read a, a, a story translated from Georgian recently, and I remember the, in the introduction, the translator said she had difficulty, but she couldn't tell when, you'd think the context would help, but when the, the writer of the story was referring to Rambo, and when the writer was referring <laughs> yes. to Hambo, <laughs> both of whom you would translate, right, uh, you would transform into Georgian kids the same way. Um, slightly different associations, obviously. At a glance, I'll ask these guys to read this out in a moment, but at a glance you can see that the opening of... Um, so there's an Italian story you can't see here. This is Zadie's translation of the Italian. In between, what you can't see is my Jen's translation of that. And then Tasha's version. Um, and even at a glance, this is just the, the beginning of the story, but this is, the, this is an equivalent section. Um, 
And you can tell that something's happened to it. <laughs> and what we don't know, and I'm not sure whether it's possible to know, is whether, whether apart from everything else that doubled in length, whether that happened in the process of going from Zaidi to Marjan, or whether it happened in the next I stage. Think yeah, I think um, well, we know I it's Marjan. I'm sure you know. <laughs> subsequently, we find, yeah. out, we find out. But for those of us who are, who are only reading the English, yeah. th th there are two transformations that happen between one English and the next English. Um, and so we have no idea which of you has been And, and actually, we, we realised this quite late on in the process of putting the edition together. Um, and so then what we did at McSweeney's was we asked every novelist who'd taken part if they... So we realised that exactly this, that you wouldn't know where the kind of yeah. distortion had occurred. Um, and so every novelist, if they wanted to, was, was, was given the opportunity to write as, as lengthy as they wished, a kind of commentary on what they'd done. Um, some people really didn't want to, which is quite interesting, and some people wrote... But they're very passes. revealing, the ones that yeah. do, in many cases. Yeah. Um, not least because everyone interpreted the, the non-brief in very different ways. Yeah. So did you want us to... Yeah, let's, shall we um, hear this? Adam, would you read... If I be Zadie. Zadie. Yeah. Um, so this is Zadie Smith's translation of the original Italian story. So this the is the beginning Italian of a story which I think she, and, and in fact, even the title is different, actually. The title has changed. So she point. called her story Umberto Butti, um, and it has an epigraph. It's true, like all mammals, it has two eyes, a nose, a mouth, and somewhere four limbs. Uh, J.R. Wilcock. <laughs> the book but not of for long. Um, he is born in Empoli on the 30th of April, 1931, son of Stefano Butti, holder of a degree in chemistry, and of Concetta Valori, a mathematics teacher at the Technical Institute. His father, director of the Osveco firm, it produces thermal valves, has published three literary articles and five rather minor editorials in Livorno's Telegraph. He often claims to have sacrificed the lettered life for two plus two equals four. He still recalls those Greek and Latin verses of his school days, declaiming them with all the sonority of an auctioneer. He asks his son to name their authors, and each time his son denies all knowledge of them. He dedicates the same attention to modern poetry. He is like a spectator in the gallery, always ready to boo or applause in a manner usually reserved for the efforts of opera singers. For poets, he lies in wait. He has an unbounded admiration for D'Annunzio, whose lyrics he calls sheet music. Thank you. Tash, would you read two, two steps down? <coughs> this is the absolute truth. Like all mammals, it has two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, as well as long, unevenly, unevenly placed limbs. It's from On Monsters by J.R. Wade Cook. <laughs> <laughs> Inspired <laughs> loosely. <laughs> oh, the title is uh, Tian Huayi. <laughs> Tian Huayi was born on, 30th, on the 30th of April, 1930, in the war-torn southern Chinese city of Guangzhou. His father, Tian Shulin, had studied for a doctorate in chemistry in Italy, his mother, Juliet, a Florentine, had followed her husband to China the previous year and had found a job as a mathematics teacher in the Technical Skills Institute not far from where they lived. His father worked as a sales manager for an Italian company called Scala, whose principal product was imported thermal valves. He was passionate in his love of literature and ideas and had published in the Guangzhou Daily three pieces of literary criticism and five Italian poems in translation. He often bemoaned the fact that he had sacrificed his literary aspirations for the everyday monotony of his thoroughly commercial job. And whenever he reflected on his life, he would become nostalgic for his time as a student in Italy, when he used to recite lines of poetry aloud, as bright and clear as the ringing cries of brokers in an auction house. He often tested his son on the names of these po those poets, but of course, each time, Tian Huayi would simply gaze out of the window at the rivers and hills beyond and shrug his shoulders. Needless to say, this response scarcely added to his father's feeling of self-worth. <laughs> Tian Shulin barely noticed Japan's surrender and the end to the Second World War. <laughs> his Italian employer was on the verge of bankruptcy, yet his main preoccupation was scouring the art section in the newspapers in search of the latest poems. On finding them, he would alternate between hissing and applause, just like a rowdy theatre audience. In his son's imagination, his return from work each day would seem as dramatic as a singer's arrival on stage. Music sheet in hand, ready to break into song, a concert of colourful lines from D'Annunzio, his favourite Italian poet. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, well, that's very lovely. Um, I, I don't know what to ask apart from what is it. Um, can you, Tash, can you say something about what has happened between, <laughs> between the first and the second one? And, to, and which bits of it you feel, okay. and, and, and what your relationship is well, to it, in the sense that... But I, I, what I can say is I, I think I've been... But certainly, certainly my approach throughout, my conscious approach throughout was that, was that I would be very faithful to the text. So I, I wouldn't, I knew that somehow in this experiment we were being encouraged to do something revolutionary. But I think there are problems when you're dealing with a text that has come to you from someone who is at A, alive, very much alive, and B, a very well-known writer. Mm. Um, we weren't allowed to communicate with them. So I couldn't, although I had Matien's email address, I just couldn't, you know, I, I didn't, think it was correct for me to write to him and say actually what did you mean by that I knew I, I was always I found I was always trying to guess at what he, what he had done because I could sense that he had changed quite a lot I knew it had come, it had come originally from Italian um, and what I decided to do was just to go along with what with his transpositions um, and not question too much um, I thought the setting was very strange to begin with. I just couldn't quite get to grips with this character. Um, I felt that the, the entire translation had to come from an understanding of the character. And it took me a while to try and reinvent this person. to sort of, And I, I think that's where the novelist instinct comes in to the translation bit. Where I actually had to, I felt I had to feel the character, I had to know what kind of things he might have been, might, might have been going through his head in order to give him the correct tone. Mm. Once I decided that, once I felt I knew this character, I was then into more technical things. So, for example, um, the very basic thing of, of giving the short, the, the what's essentially quite a short story, um, an, an epic feeling to it. Um, the Chinese, and I, and I suppose like, uh, like the Italian before, I, I sensed had probably used the first, uh, the, the present tense. Um, my Italian's really bad, but I've done a certain amount of translating in French, and I think that there's a way in which um, French and Italian, the Romance languages, use the present tense in a slightly more flexible way than, it's, than it does in English. And I think in English, for me at least, it gives a very particular feeling to a piece. So I decided to do everything in, in the past tense, um, which to me gave it a certain rhythm, it gave, it gave it a certain pace, it allowed me to slow down a little bit, the pace that Matien had injected into this, because it, it's quite a frantic thing, it covers a mm. long period of, of time. Um, it was a very, it felt to me like a very Chinese story. I couldn't, I, or I couldn't quite see how the Italian came into it. And I, that, I think, bothered. It's just a thermal valve. Suddenly, well, you're, <laughs> you're back with a maker of thermal valves, and then no, you disappear again. And no, that, I think, that once you leave those first passages behind, it, it then becomes terribly Chinese, it really, yeah, really yeah. Chinese. It, it sort of, I mean, it, it basically charts a whole period of, of Chinese history um, from the end of the Second World War right up into the present day. Mm. Um, and I had to sort of constantly resist asking myself too many questions about what Matien has had done to this story, uh, and and just to try and deal with it as as it came came up, uh, and try and and try and make it fit what I the structure that I, I thought that I had devised for it. I was just thinking because um, what this story is is it's the original is a in a very short space, like kind of 20 pages, it is a life story of a kind of, the, an average man is the kind of idea that it would just describe this guy who didn't really like his father and so reacted against his father's love of poetry and became a kind of scientist and kind of, and the idea is just, it's really a kind of, in the Italian or in, in, in Zadie's English, it's very much a, a story almost that one can understand in a certain literary tradition of valuing everyday experience over kind of the world of politics or the kind of the outside world, the public world. Um, and then what I found very interesting about by Marjan's decision was that um, there are certain dates mentioned, 1931, 1966 and 1989, uh, which Beauty mentions completely basically at random. Um, and then he was saying that as he kind of first thought about this story, he realized that these all corresponded to very important dates in Chinese history. Um, so that simply transposing it to China 
it was in the, the the story had to become a political story because it's elevated somehow by this person who was just happily living an ordinary life. If they were happily living an ordinary life and therefore not noticing the 1989 event, say, <laughs> that's a very different person to to an Italian. And so the transposition I found fascinating because it's basically quite a faithful translation, apart from the change of place. Um, but the change of place therefore completely alters the meaning of the story or it seems to alter the intention behind it. But quite um, a faithful translation, a translation apart from the change of place does sound like... <laughs> that's quite a big apart from. I mean, it's quite a... I mean, yeah. g- given that we're not allowed to do that kind of thing, um, it, it does seem well, like actually, that's something, a, yeah. something which is very profound about this is different. And I think it was... It's, it's not a cosmetic thing. Yeah, and it, was, but it, was, it was that idea of commission that I found... One of the, was one of the things I wanted to explore with this whole project, that I think in poetry, and I'm not even sure ethically how I feel about it, there is that tradition kind of that Lowell kind of did of you basically get your friend who actually speaks the language to give you a kind of crib to the uh, original and then you as grand poet are allowed to make your own poem and add stanzas and do what you like. Um, And it's certainly not, if the new Penguin classic translation of Les Liaisons Dangereuses did that, everyone would be Appalled and would yes, get a little translation and give it to Martin Amos and yeah. say, make a proper novel. Make it kind of now. <laughs> um, but, it was, but, 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 but I was kind of interested in why can't we restore a cert- to the to translation of fiction? I wonder what would happen if a certain. I think it's worth kind of just, just describing briefly how Matien translated from because Matien. He also works with exactly. Flora Drew. Should his English read, is not. Should I read his little explanation? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in his. Um, uh, well, in Majen wrote a small note afterwards, so he says, uh, My first thought on reading Umberto Buti was that the protagonist seems strangely Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone to Majen seems strangely Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> With his rejection of politics, aversion to risk, sense of inferiority and thwarted desires. I asked myself, okay. if, he'd be, <laughs> if he'd been born in China in 1931, how many details of his story would have to be altered? How much would the change of place affect his fate? I should make clear that as my grasp of English is still dreadfully poor, my initial reading was aided by Google Translate and online dictionaries, and then, much more helpfully, by a recorded translation my partner, Flora Drew, made for me, which I then replayed, transcribed, and rewrote. I didn't ask for clarifications, and she didn't check my finished piece. <laughs> Flora and Marjen work very closely together, and she's his principal. She's his only translator, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, and, and so, that you know, it's, it's more... There is more symbiosis than that perhaps suggests. Okay, yeah. However, um, I, I think that I think it, that's really key to see how he made, I think he didn't, he, perhaps that total absence of language uh, of English, near total absence of language um, on his part enabled him to have that freedom to make those leaps. Whereas, Without the anxiety about what's, exactly. what's there. That, Adam, you were talking about the, the, the Laurel thing, you used the word uh, you, you, you said you weren't comfortable about the the ethics, I think was the word you yeah. used. And I know that you've done, you do something similar, and this, this book ends with a translation you did with a friend of yours from a language that you don't work from. Um, and again, in the preface, you say something about you're not sure if it's entirely ethical. What, yeah, what and that's really a lie. I think I, well, it, it's, it, I mean, was, it was precisely when, when thinking that I might be in front of an audience of trained translators, <laughs> uh, I, I put in the ethical worry. Um, you're not really worried at all. <laughs> it's fine. Um, no, I think that there is an ethical... I think what's interesting about trans... Well, one, there's millions of things that are interesting. One of them is the question of property. Um, that it's almost that there is this strange tussle over ownership. And it's, I, I find it very interesting when Tash says... Well, there's Marjan. He's a kind of both a very good novelist who a, Tash actually knows and also is very much alive and is kind of mm-hmm. there. Um, and it was interesting to see how... I kind of started to develop this kind of four, a sort of cate- four categories of the, the known dead, the unknown dead, the known alive, and the unknown alive. And as Donald Rumsfeld might have called it. <laughs> and, um, and the way people the approach dead, their the dead translation, dead, the dead living, and the it definitely altered. So, for instance, the Kafka translation I found, we, we chose a relatively unknown story from, from Kafka's notebooks. Um, and people were absolutely terrified, basically, of changing that much because he was such a canonical writer um, that it was only really when we got to about the fifth iteration, so it was kind of that far away from kind of France himself, that people felt able to do something a little bit... Um, so that by that point, he wouldn't have noticed he, that Yeah, he wasn't going <laughs> to notice. And that, is that ownership? Is that, it wouldn't it well, I, and really I belong to that's where it, this and it's interesting that there's anymore. obviously a way of, you know, what, what you're tampering with and what proper, who, what belongs to who, mm. and that the... Um, 
I, I think it also, I think it, it's to do, the whole question of fidelity is tied up with notions of, of, of how much liberty, of, li- of liberation, I mean, how much liberty you feel as a translator, how, you know, how much, how free do you feel? Mm. And I think, you know, for example, we've talked about um, Camus, for example. If it's some, someone who's been much translated, and there are lots and lots and lots of translations, I mean, translations of that writer, I think perhaps in that case, if one were to be translating a writer like that, you might feel that this is your chance to do something a little bit more, a bit more daring, a bit more risque, and that you're, you're not, not necessarily jeopardizing you're not going to je- jeopardize exactly yeah. the, the mm. whole you know the way people read him. Whereas I didn't mm. feel that knowing nothing about the the, the, yeah. the 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 root story, I could do this. And I think a lot of people, um, what's interesting, just looking through this collection, um, is that. You can see the various levels of anxiety that people feel on this precise subject. I mean, some mm. people obviously just felt, no, I can't depart at all. Mm. Um, I'm going to stick very rigidly. Um, other people just felt that they didn't understand what was going on. What, they didn't know what was, what was being given to them. Therefore, they weren't going to give a damn and they would just do whatever they wanted. Mm. Um, so I, I think it, there, a lot of it has to do with... with with the times in which you you live, how you're attached to those emotionally to the writers whom you're translating, and your relationship to the language, or your yeah. in some cases almost complete lack of relationship to the language. Yeah. You said there were some who there were some writers here who basically yeah there were some who it turned out claimed to speak French and um, did not speak French. <laughs> Uh, but they speak French, where kind of everyone vaguely speaks yeah. French. But, no, but, um, no. but did they? Did they? What? What were their? Tra- I mean, I haven't had time to, to look at all these <laughs> translations. But what were they? Were their translations wildly off, but somehow exciting? Or I mean, like, I think in some cases yes. I think in, like um, <laughs> in some cases no. I mean, one of the ones, one of the examples I did find quite fascinating actually was um, there was a, this very short story by this, this alive Dutch writer, um, A.O. Schneiders, and. Lydia Davis had translated it in an incredibly uh, given that Lydia always translates you know she said to me I will do this but you know you've got to realize that my body I will only ever translate in as rigorously faithful a kind of manner as possible um, and then she went into French uh, a French novelist Yannick Enel who that another person who lied to me who, who claimed to speak English and then only <laughs> after submitting the translation said actually I, I you know I found this very difficult and it was only about three paragraphs and I thought, um, <laughs> And would have been, you'd found, found it less difficult if you'd spoken English. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then Yannick's French was put into English by Heidi Julewitz, um, an American novelist. Um, and basically, the combination of Heidi not really speaking French and Yannick not really speaking English meant that, therefore, <laughs> by kind of iteration four, a lot of literal errors had crept in. Um, flutes had become recorders and were now hanging on walls. And, and the one that I... <laughs> The one I liked most was um, that Heidi didn't know the word, um, the French word for um, an attic uh, or an attic room, which is where some music lessons were happening. And so she just substituted a grape arbor. Um, <laughs> so suddenly these lessons were now occurring in a grape arbor. And I didn't even really know the phrase grape arbor in English. Um, but but was she, I mean, she knew she didn't know She this. knew she didn't know the word. And so and it wasn't decided, that she didn't look it up. She decided that she, she decided she wouldn't look it up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I would love to be able to do that. What would happen if you wrote to a publisher? Do you know, there's some words I didn't know, but I just stuck other words in. Um, it's obviously a noun. You can tell from the context it's a noun. That's why I picked a noun. Um, try that at summer school tomorrow. But, um, and what was interesting was that um, the, what I found, it, it is a very short story, and I wonder if that was important, that it's a very perfectly constructed three or four paragraph miniature. And I would say, though, that still, by the time you're on number four, the, uh, the, what I find interesting about this project is you start wanting to use words that I find deeply kind of worrying and um, sort of philosophically, but you start kind of thinking, well, the essence of this story is still there, but the soul of this story is fine, that, and that in a sense that uh, what you realised as you saw this mangled, graffitied version is that the thing that was, I believe, interesting to A.L. Snyder's in his initial writing of the story was a cert- to catch a certain tone. And the tone had entirely survived um, through everybody's translation. In, I think that the, the miniature plot had entirely imploded, and um, the details, so the, the, as it were, the nouns. But one would gone. normally you would expect the, the risk that the opposite would happen. You'd expect the, as it were, the data to survive, but the, the tone yeah. to change, or the texture to change, or those things which are which you 
associate with language and with very specific words and syllables. That's the kind of thing which you would normally think would be at risk. Surely. Yeah, but it's interesting that even say in town, you know, when you're talking about that you were trying to find the right tone, and I think definitely there are... The other thing that is interesting if you compare the two English versions of this Italian story is that I have no idea if it's literally the, the tone of the Italian, but certainly there is a similarity yeah, there is. between the two stories, which is odd given that all of the details are different. Yeah, exactly. No, I, 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 thought, I thought that when it, when it came out. I mean, I, th I think the, the, the t tonality is very, you know, if not identical, you know, it's so, certainly you know, within the same register. Yeah. But I'm interested in one of the few other chains that, we, that I have read in this, which is the, the one that ends with Wyatt Mason's thing, to, mm. which you were telling me about. Earlier. Okay, so this, I would say, was one of the, the chains that I think is just awful. <laughs> Um, and uh, basically, I had asked uh, a writer who I think is a very great living writer, Laszlo Kresna Hawkeye, um, if he would be interested in giving us one of the originals, like an original to be then translated. In Hungary. So he gave me uh, a chunk, and I could see his translator just at the back. Um, so he gave us a chunk of, I think, a work in progress uh, that he was working on. Um, I then came up against one of the main. I, f I should say, when it says edited by me, I feel that the word editing implies a degree of um, control over a, an object that I didn't in any way possess. Uh, because I was constantly just grappling with chance factors. Wrangled so, by. So Laszlo sends in this Hungarian, and, at this, and I wasn't really definitely, so I'd asked him, but not really expecting him to say yes. So meanwhile, uh, the, another Hungarian novelist I admire very much, Peter Esterhazy, had said that he would take part in the project. And I only knew one person who was a novelist, and that was the rule, was that they had to be novelists, who could translate Hungarian to English. She was the American novelist, Julie Oranger. Um, and so I'd already signed her up, as it were, for the Esterhazy. So suddenly I had this, and then Laszlo's arrives, and so I now have a piece of <laughs> an original Hungarian and no one to translate it. So then, very sweetly, Laszlo translated it himself into German, being the other language he could um, speak. Um, and then I had to find someone who could do this quite dense uh, Hungarian-German prose, um, and I needed it now to get into English, um, given our rules. Um, and so I sent it to Lawrence Norfolk, um, who came up with the most extraordinary... I think probably deep down he didn't really like what Laszlo had written, that he wasn't actually in tune with it. And so he couldn't cope with, I suppose, its high seriousness. Um, and so he came up with a villanelle. <laughs> um, which uh, was a basic translation, but it had so sort of, it was so strange that then the, like, it, it was almost as if it had just ruined the, and, and I think, interestingly, it had changed the tone. And it was almost, and that is where I find it very interesting, that it was actually quite, I, in terms of pure line for line, I reckon it's probably quite a good translation. But the change of tone was so strange that then the next person in the chain, a French novelist, Florence Zeller, didn't know what to do with it at all, and so essentially just wrote a new story. So by the time it, the Zelle, so that, and but there, the, it, it was a new, not just a new story, but it, again a, sh a very big shift in tone. And a big shift in tone, and so it by now bore absolutely no relation to Laszlo's, and so I felt th the game had basically gone wrong. In, that's the one chain I think the game went. But very but wrong. it's interesting that Wyatt Mason's final translation from French, from French into English, again, is marked by a very big shift in tone, and it's uh, what's really clear is that. None of, and I think he says in his notes, I, well, maybe I'm imagining that he just couldn't get the grips of it, didn't understand it, and basically didn't like it. Mm. And and so what you're saying now that Florian didn't understand Lawrence Norfolk and Lawrence didn't understand that, yeah. so then basically what you have is four people not just hating the thing that's yeah. come to them, yeah. and, and not, so not quite committing, to not it. quite committing to it, and thinking, yeah. well, I, yeah. you know, why should I? Um, I've been given a free brief, so I'm, and, yeah. I'm not being paid, so I'm, you know. <laughs> So I'm just going to... Yes, the other question, were you paid for this? I should <laughs> A very small amount was given to each. <laughs> um, yeah, but I would say, and it, but in a sense, the failure was instructive as well, that that was part... I mean, I was sad that it was, you know, Laszlo, who's a writer I hugely admire, and that therefore him doing a huge amount of work had just ended up in baffling everybody. But as part of the project, it was mm. interesting because it, it didn't work. Did um, you not expect it to fail more? Yes, in retrospect, should given, not have failed it should have failed more because I'm surprised by how readable most of the stories are, as it were, yeah, and how yeah, different yeah. enough they are to count as different stories and yet the same story. Um, it shouldn't have been. There are a couple of other chains where I think the versions are sometimes too similar. Yeah. Um, 
but mostly it the versions are too be, similar in a in that everyone translated basically so closely that there isn't much interest in reading more than one of them, if you see what I mean. That the kind but also what's interesting is that because you, you, will read, you can read all the English ones and some of the other ones, yeah. but you can't read all of no. the, the interstitial ones, as it were, yeah. which means that you wouldn't know necessarily whether Tash was doing something uh, very free and very wild and completely on his own. Oh, yeah, so without, without so, so the there, notes so that at you, the back... You have you no way of knowing yeah. until the notes come through actually how many of them are... Yeah. Um, Definitely. Are, are and close. There, and that's there a, is a very close pair between Margent and Tasha's, but you, you can't necessarily see that yourself. Yeah. And it's true that it's interesting to me this idea of what you can read that I did like, and that was only a retrospective pleasure, was suddenly realizing this was a book where no one reader really will read the same book because, depending on their language skills, some yeah, people will be fine with the Icelandic but have a huge problem with the English. Um, and some from you know, so that the the idea that this was an unreadable object in its entirety to basically everybody because there are seventeen languages in here, um, but that each right each reader will presumably have slightly different kind of things that they feel. Um, so there will be things that I'm not able to spot that you know, certainly you will be able to spot or you will spot. So and that was a quite a fun thing. One of the things that's really pleasing from from my point of view about this is I love the fact that you asked novelists to do this because. Novelists in English tend not to translate, and novelists everywhere else tend to. Well, that was part of tend to translate. That's when Tashi mentioned that you do occasionally translate from French. You have done some translation, but I wonder, and this is a really dumb question, but I wonder why this is. I wonder whether it is something to do with a sense of ownership and a sense of how you writers feel attached to a style which they don't want to uh, cede somehow. Because it's, it seems so, I mean, just running through the, the list in the back of the writers I know, most of the non English language ones are translators, yeah. and most of the English language ones are not. Um, it's very hard to think of someone, uh, an English language novelist, whose job is principally as a novelist who also translates. I can think of one. And if you can think of one, you're thinking of the same one I'm thinking of, um, who is Maureen Freely, and she is sort of the one. Um, I mean, there, I mean, I'm thinking of that of the people in that book. Lydia Davis does translate. It's yeah, not her, yeah. Yeah, like almost equally. Kurtzea has done translations. Yes, um, he used, he used to do. So those are two in the book. It's mm. true of the English language novelists, um, but it's true. It's it's very rare. I do think part of it is a purely time thing that I think that if you're suddenly asked to translate Madame Bovary, as it were, that's going to be a lot of time, mm. and it's certainly the equivalent. I mean, it's the same. Is that or write a novel? Is that or write a novel? So I think that then that must be part of it. But I mean, I, I would I understand why you would not want to do it, but that should also apply to a Spanish novelist who is asked if he wants to translate Faulkner and says, "Yeah, why not? It means I'm not going to write a, yeah. my Spanish novel." Um, but there must be a reason why why there is this sort of imbalance. I'm not sure there is an answer to it, but I don't know. I mean, the only thing. I, I suppose as a, as a sort of basically a full-time novelist myself, the only thing I, I, I can say to explain that is, is exactly that. It's a very boring um, commercial reason because I think the, you know, the, the, the publishing world as it exists today is so much geared towards a certain kind of publishing rhythm. So mm. you don't, you're, not, you're not really encouraged to think that you can take a couple of year, years off mm. to, to do something you'd really love to do, which is to you know, translate two or three novels um, in between thinking about your... Your next one, um, but I, I, I. Do you enjoy it when you're doing it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I more than I sh- more than I, I I I feel guilty because I, I enjoy it so much, and I think it's that that makes me think it's not really you know I should be doing something something. You know, I mean, more painful. I think yeah. To be honest, yes. I, <laughs> you should be suffering. If they're going to pay you, you should suffer. My my experience of, of commissioning these translations is that it it does turn out that I mean the cliche is true that a lot of people do not speak another language. Mm. Um, even, uh, I won't name names, but there are certain novelists in there who I certainly assumed from the way they had written in the New York Review of Books or that uh, when they were commenting on Rilke translations, they therefore spoke German. And um, it turned out that they did not. Um, and so they chose to translate from something else. So, and so um, that there are certainly, I think, just, or that there would be people who I knew spoke perfectly, you know, that I've been in a Berlin restaurant with them and they're perfectly chatting away to a waiter, but when it came to Translating, therefore, they could do it, but they certainly would not have wanted to then be translating the new Gunter Grass novel, or you know that that's a different order of yeah. language. No, it, yeah, I mean, it it forces you to confront to engage with the language in a totally different yeah. way. I mean, it's not just 
It's not just even just casually reading a novel. I mean, when you're translating, you're translating. I mean, it's not. I mean, but it forces you to engage with the language you write in as well. In, yeah, in that yeah absolutely. Way. And that's one of the things that I think, if you ask a novelist, a, a, a Spanish novelist who also translates, yeah. why they do it, one of the things they get from it is it 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 forces you to exercise the muscles in which you normally write. Yeah. Um, because you're obliged to write someone else's books. No, absolutely. Um, I think I'm going to uh, allow you to ask questions and make comments um, rather than because it's coming up to three o'clock. Uh, so, shall we do that? Let's do that. Your turn. <sighs> Sam. This thing we've touched on something throughout, which is the importance of loving the original text in order to produce a, a good, whatever that means, translation. Of it. And I wondered um, to what extent you feel that that is important, uh, especially in relation to the, the idea of translator as advocate, um, mm. and as almost guidepost to to great literature from around the world or from another country. Um, how important, really, actually liking and loving the, the original text or the text you're translating, the language you're translating from, is to the process, or whether it's not at all. Tash, have you ever translated anything you really didn't like, or can you? You, you don't have to because you. No, exactly. Um, I, it's difficult for me to answer that. I, I tend not to. I, I think it, I would have thought that it's not essential. I mean, you don't have to love it in order to produce a good translation of something. But I think it certainly helps, like everything. And particularly, I think if it's a lo it's a long thing and it's a long project. I mean. You, just in terms of a day to day, the, the day to day enjoyment, it would be really difficult if you just hated every single page of this and couldn't and found it, you know, maybe for example, ethically offensive, um, you know, ideologically you just weren't in tune with it. Um, I think there is, I think there is a problem. Um, but I think if you are a really professional um, and, and intellectually rigorous translator, of course, they're, they're, um, there's no reason why you couldn't do it. But I mean, the thing is, none of the people here were, so um, so I think that was an issue. In, no one here was, was able to choose. They, they didn't know what they were getting, really. No, exactly. Yeah. The opening person often shows the original that they would then translate. Right. So, um, and I'm just thinking, it's true that I definitely think there has to be some over... I mean, I'm just thinking about this project that I think you can almost say two contradictory things because I was thinking initially, yeah, the ones that worked really well were where the person's own style and kind of like literary preferences overlapped with what they were translating. But then actually the opposite was also true for some people that I feel that certainly say Zadie translating this story, this story in no way resembles something Zadie herself would normally write. Mm -hmm. And actually I think I'm quite kind of pleased with that as a kind of commissioning as it were, where I feel like she would never have mm. chosen to translate that story. Um, it doesn't sort of overlap with stuff she's interested in and yet I think precisely well, because of that it? it works very yeah. well because she was having to really kind of um, as it were imagine the process I mean that's a very interesting thing I think where you have to end up as a novelist you're used to imagining the character or imagining the atmosphere or whatever that you want to do but the language is almost a given because that's your th that's the atmosphere you're in and then as a translator you're almost having to imagine the language you know imagine the style that this is, is going to match and I think that was so there, I think almost it's her skill as a novelist that enables her to imagine another style that isn't the one she would normally use. Um, but it's true that definitely when someone was evidently just out of sync for whatever reason, it didn't work unless they so changed it that it became <coughs> their own thing and then it might still work. So for instance, there's, there's one of the chains began as an Arabic, a story in Arabic, um, and which, which was translated by Rari Hager into English which went into French by Tristan Garcia, who and Tristan didn't really like the, the what I gave him. So he certainly or he initially subjected to that what he got to quite a quite a lot of editing. Um, so that a lot of the kind of aspects that were evidently quite intrinsic to the Arabic original that he didn't like stylistically, he cut. So he made it a much sparer story. But then Joe Dunthorne, an English novelist, who then translated that, he still didn't like Tristan's, and so he basically turned it into his own story um, and just kept a few elements, um, but did write a very good story. So, um, but whether that, I would, I would not call that a translation. By that point, it had stopped being in any way a, a really a version of the original. Um, How closely yeah. did you follow that process when people were, did you know what they were doing while they were doing it? 
No, I mean, they write and say, I'm having an absolute nightmare with this one, I don't know what to do. No, it would be more that people would send it to me saying, I hated this, so I've done this, or I love this, and so I've expanded this, or it, it was more, I didn't really, maybe occasionally, but I wasn't trying, I was deliberately trying to keep myself out of it as much as possible. Um, but I do think that is important. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you would try uh, another experiment, it's like a different one, I, and partly because I didn't know much about this project before this afternoon, and uh, I thought, I had gotten into my head somehow that the, the Chinese whispers was, was happening with um, national translators, you know, and that you, you would end up getting a story and only have the, the version in the language for which you translate, but not know the original. So what I was wondering is you obviously chose, you know, authors and well-known authors to, to experiment with, how would they manage the style aspect of it? Oh no, that wasn't the assumption. The assumption wasn't that there would be better style. The assumption was purely a person who is used to only writing in their own style. Yeah. Uh, whereas I would say a good translator is going to be able to adopt the st that there will. It's true that you can probably. Well, actually, I think it's a very interesting issue, but it's slightly separate. Is whether a translator who translates five books a year that you can still see their kind of imprint mm -hmm. on everything. That's, uh, and I think that's definitely true. Actually, that you can see it. Um, but it wasn't the assumption that the novelist. It was purely. It was to thinking that they would be so unused to trying to think about another style. Yeah, I think the, the interesting thing is to see yeah. to see the tiny gaps between um, you know, the way a novelist thinks when they when they have their no novelist hat on and uh, the way they think when they have a translate their translating hat on and, and how strong the the competing instincts are. So, so for example, in, in the in this example, um, in this case, Zadie, who's obviously a very fine novelist and has a very strong sense of her own style, how much she's then willing to subjugate it because that really is not at all Zadie's style. So she's very kind of almost petrified by the Italian and and treating it with I think a bit too much respect. Um, and not daring to make it her own, which I think you know all transla good translations have to be in, uh, to a certain degree. Whereas others that you've described, the novelist instinct, to go, oh, the translator's yeah. instinct goes along to a certain way before never, uh, yeah. before the, the the novelist instinct kicks in and says, you know, sorry, I just can't, I can't be bothered yeah. with this. I'm too you know I'm too lazy or whatever. I, I just need to do my own thing, mm. um, and I say I think that is an interesting um, yeah. an interesting. It's I, I think that it's not so much. It's, it's not so much a question of what is a good translation or what what makes a good translation, which I thought was the the, the point of the the pro, the, uh, the project, the, the the purpose of the experiment. Really, I mean, to me, uh, what I felt the more I read about it and the more I saw the things coming out from it, was, was that it does focus on the element of of style, and I, I don't mean style in terms of you know how beautiful the prose is, how good the writing is, but how that particular, how strong the the instincts are of a full-time novelist, and how much <laughs> that style rules everything else. How much that that sense of their own style, rather than style in general, um, is allowed to to dominate other considerations. And I think that's an interesting process. Yeah. I mean, I think to, I think definitely it would be interesting to take one of these stories and, as it were, organise six mm. professional translators and see. What the, you know, how different that would, would end up. I think that would be an interesting thing to do. Well, which is, which this is morning, what um, the, yeah. the, um, the, the Harville Secker Prize is. Um, it's lots of versions of the same thing. Lots we of did, in, in the Portuguese script, that we, yesterday we translated about 200 words, um, 227 words, <laughs> roughly, uh, in our <laughs> six hours of work yesterday. Um, and we did it very, very carefully, trying to be perfect, and did it with the author present. And one of the things we did today is I asked the author to translate that back into English, uh, back into Portuguese. And so we have a kind of micro version of this. Yeah. But in both cases, we're trying to, those of us who are translating are trying to subsume any temptation to use whatever style we have. Yeah. But um, it's also, yeah, I think, I think it's, a, it's a good question because it, I mean, it, it, it obviously touches on, on the boundary between um, pure translating and pure creativeness. 
which is obviously a huge area. So how much translators are actually writers? And obviously mm. the answer is that you know, the best translators are also the best writers. I mean, that, that's obvious. Mm. I mean, and that prize, in the prize that, I, that we mentioned, that I was a judge for last year, um, the Harvest Echo Prize for young translators, it was open only to people um, who really, for whom translating was their principal um, activity. And it's one language every year. Last year happened to be Chinese. Um, and it's the same story. Everyone translates the same story. And so you're reading hundreds of versions of the same story. Mm. And obviously the translations vary wildly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't, you know, linguistically, it wasn't a difficult story to translate, mm. but it was, it was slightly absurd. It was very funny. Um, so getting the tone right was difficult. And it was really clear when we, you know, as as we got down to the the, the end, it was really clear that um, that the best ones had to negotiate this very tricky course between allowing their own natural storytelling, their own narrative power to to imprint itself on it on the t on the text. On the one hand, on on the other hand, being linguistically and technically and culturally faithful to to the Chinese. So. Um, so I think you know, that is, you know, it, it's an issue for everyone. I just think novelists um, are less successful at being articulate about what's going on inside them when they're, when they're doing that, which is why I think for a lot of people it was a very interesting experiment mm. because of the, for the first time they were, they were forced to, to think, well, actually, do I have my style that everyone talks about, you know, my voice, my, my trademarks, I mean, all these flourishes, can I actually use them? Yeah. And what so, is this skill? Yeah, exactly. what is this yeah. skill? You know, so, so you know, Zadie, who, you know, if you gave her a blank sheet of paper in any circumstance, if you said, you know, write me a review of this book or write me uh, an article on um, the war in Israel, she would produce a, a, mm. a fantastic witty thing. And, and in fact, what that is, is quite a prim translation. It's not, you know, it doesn't have these flourishes. Mm. So I think that's, it's an, it's an interesting... I mean, I think... What, it, what I think was interesting, or what, definitely what was behind the experiment was particularly to try and think differently about what a style is. Um, and I think one of the things that I find interesting about when translation kind of is at issue is it does reveal that I think there's a huge amount of the way literary criticism works that concentrates on the sentence. Um, and so there's a huge amount of showing off almost as a critic that you will say, well, the, you know, the sentences are very beautiful. Um, and this has become almost just a cliche, I think. Um, and I would say that actually what you kind of gradually realise is that the unit of someone's style might not be at all the sentence. It might be the paragraph or it might be a certain trick of construction. Um, that there's much more sort of like force fields in a style that um, rather than just literal building blocks of one sentence after one sentence. Um, and that in any given work, there will be some things which if you get them wrong, then you have destroyed the story. And actually, a huge most of the points, as it were, in this moving force field, you can generally slightly get wrong, and that won't be such a problem. So long as the, whatever is. The uh, I mean, one of the things I find interesting with the say with the Kafka is that the story is given traditionally. It's, it wasn't given a title by Kafka, but it's called Das Tier in the Synagogue, the, the animal in the synagogue. Um, and synagogue was the word that John Ray, the first translator, used, um, but then. Etka Keret translated that into Hebrew, and when Nathan Englander translated the Hebrew back into English, he shul. translated it as shul, um, <laughs> which to me, as North London Jewish, shul to me is very politicized, basically. Like, it, it is the American orthodox, mm. uh, whereas I grew up saying synagogue. Um, and so to me, shul was like, it, it's just a different thing. And then it changes again. And then the um, Alejandro Zambra translates it in Spanish and decided to just call it a casa, so it's the animal in our house. Um, <laughs> and so th that is so. Those seem to me to me massive changes because that word it turns out is it's kind of a force field around which a lot of the story accretes. Mm -hmm. So that changing that is kind of. But if you'd changed, you know, if if you describe the the weasel or whatever it is as kind of five foot rather than four foot, that to me is completely irrelevant um, and not. It would to me that's not an inaccurate translation if you happen to get that wrong or chose to change it. How much of the, the difference between what as were a novelist, but a full-time novelist would do in a full-time project would do is just also to do with intent and not to do with their relationship with their own style. I mean, I asked this partly because we did an exercise recently, a thing for Radio 4, where four of us translated the same bit of 
around the world in 80 days, and there were three of us who were professional translators, and Naomi Alderman, who was a novelist. And all four are different, but three of us are different in sort of the same way, because we're obviously trying to do the same thing, but doing it in different ways. And Naomi, who is a novelist, just sometimes can't help herself, and she can't stop being a novelist. And however well she knows the French, and however good she is at assembling a piece of writing, there are moments when she can't help herself from going, well, I, d- I didn't like that bit, so I didn't do it. Yeah. And this, it doesn't work. And, and the, the turning points in the narrative don't make sense, so I moved them. Um, but it wasn't. But the, 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 the ones that Frank and Adriana and I did were as different. If you were simply to count how many sentences the same, how many syllables the same, um, but we were all aiming for the same thing. We had we, we sort of knew what a success looked like. If you see what I mean, and then we I think wanted something different. Yeah, I think there's a lot of that going on in, in multiples. Um, from, from what I can sense just by flicking through it, and I certainly knew I I, I felt the same instincts myself. Um, but, but rather than, I mean, the way I dealt with it was, was not to change things so much, but just to um, iron out the, the raw edges. I, you know, on the one hand, I say I, did, I didn't change anything, but now I'm saying I've, I've ironed out the raw edges. But I think I, I did what, what most translators do, which is that I think you strive for readability. You strive for, for the way a passage flows. And um, sometimes I knew that Martien was also working to big time constraints. So you know, there are lots of things where I thought, well, actually, that one, that sentence, you know, I, I, I can rearrange this a little bit so that it's it makes more sense because at the moment it doesn't make that much sense. And I, I can I can do these tiny little nips and tucks here and there. But I think you know the big thing is, is that the, the 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 tone remained the same, the atmosphere of the piece remained the same. But in a funny way, in yours, changing the present tense to the past tense actually was somehow, even though it's a massive thing and involved all of your verbs, yeah. is a smaller change than maybe changing something like to shul just because of yeah. the, the oh no, yeah, stuff that is. well, it's not you know that you know it's just changing tenses doesn't it's not like that example where one word is loaded with so mm. much. Well, it could be. I mean, I think what I'm trying to say is that there might be a story where the change of tense is a complete desecration. Yeah. This one, it's not. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I was just thinking there is, it does depend. You don't want to iron out too much, though, either. That's the. I think the danger of novelists getting hold of these is that they do slightly think, well, that I wouldn't write it like that. Yeah. Um, and actually, what they're not seeing is, in fact, it's very brilliant that it should be written as. You know, that there is a kind of. Uh, there is a way in which, in a sense, therefore, the, the, tra- the professional translator who has their higher standard of ethics, as it were, is therefore going to be a much better translator um, in some respects. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, I think that's true, because if you're, I mean, I think that's, you know, if you're, if you're doing 10 translations a year, you're going to be a better translation than someone who's yeah, doing, you know, what I mean is that I think there's also a problem of um, what it looks like to the outside. I think the, 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 I'm always fascinated by this concept of translation ease. Um, because it seems to me that there's two types of translationese, and one of them is definitely bad, which is where you've kind of come up with a language which isn't yes, that's the original. It's, it's just weird because it's not actually natural English if you're translating English. Um, but then, often I think a very brilliant translation will sound like translationese in the sense that it will strike the reader as something odd, and they will therefore instinctively think it's the bad translationese. That the problem I think the translation has is it doesn't have the authority of an original. Mm. In that, if a writer writes crazy, strange sentence structure, they are given the benefit of the doubt that it's assumed that they did it deliberately. Mm. If a translator does that, they need to either be a very kind of famed, known translator, so everyone, or the, the, it seems to me that that's why it almost it is almost more difficult to be a great translator because you have to win your authority almost twice. Mm. Um, well, I was thinking about the event she came to, the event we did in London a couple of months ago with Edith Grossman and Margaret Richard Costa translating the same text. Yeah. And in that instance, Edith's text was much more, it was much stranger, but it was also strange in exactly the way that yeah. Alejandro Sandro's original was strange. And Margaret had, in a sense, done something freer by making it feel not strange. Yeah. Um, if it hadn't been Edith Grossman translating that, you would assume that it was someone who'd got it wrong, <laughs> yeah. rather than assuming that it's someone who was really, really careful about maintaining a certain, you know, having springs in really funny places and sentences, yeah. and, and a, a slightly weird balance in, in the sentences. Yeah. So, uh, BJ had a question. Yeah, it's funny, you sort of touched on it a bit, but I'm going to talk about how this project has influenced your thinking about writing, and also your own creative writing work. Um. Yeah, it, I, it's certainly true. Well, I haven't. 
it's true because I was I'm I'm been writing a new novel kind of almost while I was commissioning all these pieces and having them come in. I was meant to be trying to start a new novel. Was in the middle of one, and so it completely interrupted it. And um, <coughs> I I would say it's almost the way I grew up. And kind of studying, you know, English as well, and kind of that very much. I kind of grew, the the way I taught myself was that style was the kind of absolute that a writer should attain. That kind of that the history of literature was the history of in these individual styles that got given names, like kind of brand names almost, um, and that therefore, in some way, the development of some th- some unique stamp on everything you did was the kind of crucial thing. And I think that. It has kind of exploded that for me, that I think I've become much less interested in exploiting my own style or making sure that kind of in some way this is some way relevant like, to works I've done before. Or um, I, I, I kind of touched on this actually in the introduction that I, at the same time I was kind of reading lots about Picasso and I was kind of, there was this quip that Picasso gave somewhere where someone kind of basically attacks him for constantly changing his style even, even in the same day. Um, and he comes up with this brilliantly matter-of-fact answer where he just says, well, different subjects will need different styles, different motifs, he says, need different styles. Um, so, of course, I had to kind of change from that cubist painting to this kind of other one. And, um, and it did start striking me that I think that the general way in which literature discusses style seems to be rather leaden. Um, and, based on, and more and more it strikes me as strange that we think that we want a writer to have one style because that would in some way imply that all of reality, as it were, is one thing, and that's evidently not true. And you just bring whatever lens you happen to have yeah. and you look at whatever on this one. That one. And so more and more I'm starting to <coughs> get interested, certainly in, there are very few, I think, writers with genuine multiple styles. Um, and that that's certainly, and I don't know whether that's just because it's impossible, but it, it, or whether it's just that I think, and that's where I think translation is very useful for writers, actually, is because it's a way of forcing them to, Realise that there are different ways of writing that, that, and so so it has certainly imploded a certain ideal of style, definitely. So translators are the writers who have lots of styles. Yeah, there are lots and of writers. Therefore, the greater writers, writers. All, all yeah, and I, I think there's a way in which there is. The, the, I'm, I'm not joking. <laughs> Tash, what about you? Um, I to that I was working uh, with a language that I, I I spoke you know growing up. So it was it was um, I mean, Danny and I were speaking about this recently. I mean the, um. <laughs> what it made me realise was that when you're working, often, I, I, it's a, what it made me realise is actually um, when I write in English, there's, there is a self-consciousness that I, that I think goes beyond considerations of style or voice or what, you know, all these other things, which is that um, my relationship to it is quite uncertain because quite often when I was, when I was reading the Chinese and there was sort of an idiomatic expression. I was quite, off, I just didn't really know the English equivalent to it. And I think that was actually what dictated the fact that I was going to, I, w- I would have to be quite faithful to it in, in, in the most straightforward ways because um, although I, you know, my English has been my right, main writing, my main sort of creative language for the last nearly 20 years, that at some level, I don't think I'll ever be as instinctive with it as Chinese, for example, um, or, or Malay, which is the other language I spoke as a child. Um, so for me, it sort of it made me realise that you know I do have a very tangled relationship with English, and, and, and that you know when I write English, there are um, there are limitations on, on, on what I do as as well as you know the obvious you know liberties that, that, that those limitations therefore create. Thanks. Yeah, Ken. I'm curious to as to the line if you can draw one between versions and translations, where does one become the other? Mm. There was a point when you were describing one of the changes when you said the last one, which obviously I wouldn't consider a translation anymore. There was a moment at which you, you yeah. made that distinction. Um, it's true, but I don't know quite... It's a kind of instinctive thing, you know, isn't you it? it? Like you kind of know it when you see it, and you know when something's gone too far. Um, Is that to do with intent? Something coming up to this, but what do you mean? What if someone's not actually trying anymore? To that if what you're actually trying to do is keep a certain thing, keep the essence, or keep whatever you do, it is you decide. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think I think one of the things I was interested in was how much language ability you needed, and I could. I'm thinking that in some way, I think for me, 
trans the, using the word translation definitely should imply that the person doing that translation has a pretty Super competent <laughs> um, ability in both the languages. Um, and that maybe version is a way of kind of, you know, the, I, I, I find it very tricky. I think it, it's to do with, I think it must be a mixture of comp language competence, intent, um, degree of alteration and reason for alteration. It, it'll be a whole, I mean, I think like all writing, translation is a sequence of, an infinite sequence of minute decisions and, you know, that then add up to a whole new thing. And so there will be a certain amount of those decisions which then falls over a line, I suppose, of where I think it's now more of a creative variation on something rather than being something that could substitute. I suppose it's really what you think of as a substitute. I mean, David Bellos is very good on this, I think, in his recent book about this, about what we mean, that you can't mean it's a substitute because it's quite evidently not the same thing. So it can't ever be a substitute, a translation for the original. But it can be a kind of equivalent, and it just depends what you want to be equivalent. Um, but he also kind of says the opposite. He says people always say translation is no substitute for the original, and surely that is exactly what it is. Yeah. Okay. It only so, exists to be a substitute for yeah. the original. But it's what, just a yeah. question of what what you function you want to be the same so, thing. Yeah. Of course, um, yeah. And so I think I would say it just will differ in each case. That I think that if you decide and if you're right, it's it's basically it's it's where it intersects with literary criticism partly of kind of when you, you know every translation is in some way a reading of what's important in a in a text, and so. Um, a brilliant reading, as it were, will, show, will, will somehow kind of like x-ray, like, show what's there. Mm. Um, and it might be that you can take quite a lot of liberties, as it were, so that, and yet still be a, 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 a translation. Um, so would, you call, <laughs> would you call my gen? Yeah, I was just thinking that. I was, trying, I, I was just thinking that if I were Pontidia, <laughs> <laughs> would I be happy if someone published my gen's your version of Margen as the English translation of my story, mm. and I suppose probably I'd have to admit no. But I think it would be quite close. <laughs> but I think it would be whether or not you like it is irrelevant. The question yeah. is, it has his name on it first, and but Margen's still, name second. I think does it, that does it belong to Pontigia. Yeah, but I think what I, what I mean is, if if that was going to be my Penguin classic, if I was Pontigia and that was what they did for my story in Contrasi, yeah. would I be happy? And I suppose deep down, I I, I have to admit, probably not. But. <laughs> Much less than you might think. That's what I think. You know that kind of, and in a way, maybe I could have, like, in some utopian way, I could hope that maybe he'd be fine. With no, being it. being incredibly, yeah, no. As in so far as it's a story of, essentially, a story of a man living in changing circumstances, and it charts a very particular set of circumstances, a very particular set of internal circumstances. Then yes, it's exactly yeah. the same story, but but it's all it's this decor, it's all the the, the entire the mise en scène around it, which is mm. totally totally you know been stripped apart and stripped away and put together again. Um, so, but does that make that a version rather than family? I you know I think it I think it does. Yeah. It's a clever, very clever version. Yeah, you've both been translated in yourselves into. 20, 30 languages. Uh, has this changed how you feel about what happens to your work when other people are let loose on it? Um, yeah, but you know, I think it helps because I, I that I can only read really three of those translations, so I don't really just um, as well. Just as well. I mean, I think that um, yes. I mean, I I just hope that someone does it well, but um, there's no way you can control those. Yeah. Translations, really. I think actually partly one of the reasons why I got interested in this whole project was I'd been proofing the French translation of my of my second novel and had found and, and I'd worked very closely with the French translator who I think is a very good translator and going through the kind of second galley as it were um, I found about five or six major kind of howlers as it were like kind of just you know just completely the wrong word um, and it kind of, and I think in a way, what my initial response was to think, oh my God, this is a kind of, and then, then to think how many therefore of these kind of mistakes must be in every translation, basically. Mm. Um, and then, to, and then, but then I kind of, kind of thought this is me being absolutely vain, you know. So what, you know, that kind of that noun is now a different noun, or that alliteration effect is now no longer there, you know. That a Maybe novel it's is nice being in a grape arbor, something. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> um, that it was the realization that that the st if the if the novel was going to be any good then the formal properties of it were going to have to be far larger than one or two sentences or mm. one mistake that it was going to have to be big enough to cope with a certain amount of attrition mm. um, 
And I think there's a certain amount of flux. Yeah, has, the, right? and the, and the only a bad novel would die as a result of three semantic mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just come out quite like that. Isn't it? <laughs> we want all novelists to be like him. Uh, yes, there, and then and that. Um, different type of question. We've just heard the term Chinese whispers a couple of times, and I don't know, I don't know nothing about translation. But I just wonder where, how does that term itself? Translate. Well, actually, this is a very in America. It's different. In America, it's called telephone. It's called operator. And yeah. operator. Well, what? Yeah. operator. Um, but the McSweeney's kids, they called it op- they called it telephone. And um, uh, actually, Jonathan Latham, in his thing, if I can find it, he talks about this. Um, but it meant the cover of the original McSweeney's was uh, was telephones. We had about for three different telephones by different illustrators. And I had no idea why they had chosen a telephone. <laughs> um, and so I was kind of saying, yeah, I love it. I mean, interesting. It's kind of, and they obviously thought that this was one of the most genius ideas that kind of... Um, At I, no point, presumably, did Grant to think, oh, Chinese whispers, we'll have pictures of... No, we really can't. <laughs> we really can't use um, them. Just, but hang on, if Some I can just... traditions maybe Skype. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, if I just find Jonathan... Yeah, so Jonathan actually says... Um, that he, they, he called it tele- telephone, and then he then says he looked it up on Wikipedia, and that the same game is called in different countries, Chinese whispers, broken telephone, Arab phone, silent <laughs> mail, cordless phone, grapevine, deaf phone, and whisper down the lane. <laughs> so, so it's this game that evidently everybody plays and calls it a different, slightly racist. <laughs> um, Everyone has their own favorite racist name for this yeah. game. Linguistically, there is this what's it, Arab phone. Arab phone. Right, okay. Uh, I don't know whether it's a Mandarin term or anything, but it, it just, it's just in Jerusalem, in English, about it in, and using Chinese as the sort of. Yeah, I don't know when. I haven't, we will have to look, we'll have to look this up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and last one back. Um, it just, it, you, in, when it comes to translation versions of things, we get hung up on, and there's this kind of rivalry almost between the writers and, or the poets who um, translate without knowing a language. But in, in other art forms, it, it's not a, an issue in a way. You know, you know, the Picasso would have painted something after somebody else, or um, Liszt would have arranged um, a book air or something. So, uh, you know, in a way, it's great to see it's sort of liberated. I, I think as, as a translator, it, it irritates that it's translated. Some of them call translations when they're clearly different or different in tone, you know, significantly different in tone, but I think it's, it's great to let writers off an experiment and, and maybe give maybe give us as translators a bit more uh, courage or freedom to say, I can yeah. play with this uh, and then come back and make sure that it's true to the original. Yeah, I think I have very ambivalent feelings about the kind of the poetic, this tradition of you don't speak the language, but someone else, it, they, 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 I think basically Lowell must be one of the first people to do this. Because um, it seems to me very different from when Dr. Johnson does an imitation of Juvenal mm-hmm. and moves everything to London. But that's because he speaks the Latin perfectly, not speaks the Latin, but can read the Latin perfectly. Um, so the tradition of the imitation, I think, is quite interesting, where up until a certain point, I feel that was the same as the Picasso model because there's no linguistic gap. Um, and it does worry me when suddenly something is presented as a translation when it's not, when there is no way of access to the original. I do think that's kind of... Which we see in the theatre as much as we see in yeah. poetry. You'll yeah, stop some, will someone will stop out of yeah. David Harrell, someone will, will kind of make it a proper play, and one of us will do that. Well, it's interesting, because I don't think, I think when Stoppard does that, he would never presume to write translated by Stop Tom Stoppard. He would always say, in a new version by. Yeah. And it's true that that convention doesn't apply so much in, in poetry, where often it's just presented as translated by X. Um, and, I, and I think what I don't like about it is the sort of... Rom- the sort of romantic idea that in some way because you've been designated poet you must have some greater access to this soi disant original um, that seems to me just bullshit and um, mm. annoying with your toga and your wreath yeah. and your whole poet thing um, <laughs> and seems to me to be quite kind of autocratic and, and misunderstanding what a style must be so that the idea is here is a poet with their style and therefore they will impose that and somehow just by the virtue of it being a style, it's therefore inherently interesting. And well, often the ones that don't work very well are the ones where you can see this poem trying desperately to be a poem by the new yeah, poet. Exactly. And it's and there's a huge, terrible tension with 
the poem which it used to be once upon a time. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm thinking. Lowell, you know, Lowell's Imitations is a book that I have absolutely loved ever since I first read it, and was I think hugely influential in some way on how I, this whole idea of style and what's yours and what's not. But it interests me that I think his best translations are from French, where he actually does speak it um, basically quite well. Mm. Um, so I think his Baudelaire is still one of the great Baudelaires. Um, and it's completely rearranged, and obviously, you know, with wrong stanzas in the wrong place and kind of... Mm. Uh, but I find it much more convincing than, say, his Pasternak, which I think is not successful at all, uh, and where he doesn't speak any Russian. So, but I don't know if that, you know, is just because I speak some Russian, so therefore I get more annoyed. Mm. <laughs> but you, but the, you talked in the introduction I mentioned earlier about, about a certain, the ambivalence you have, even in the one you did yourself at the back of this book where someone produced something from you, for you to work from? Well, there we did, uh, just, um, yeah, what I did was, as my last experiment was, um, uh, I decided to, to, as a kind of crazy thing, to do, I speak no Italian, um, and my Italian editor had been always saying to me that, for, in his opinion, the greatest Italian novelist of the 20th century was, was Gadda, was Carlo Emilio Gadda. Um, and there's only one, there's a William Weaver translator, a translation of one of the novels, um, which I tried to read and it felt kind of horrible. Like it just sort of, it's not one of William Weaver's best mm. moments. Um, but also part of the problem is that Gadda is just an incredibly difficult novelist because he has about 17 different registers and kind of very difficult sentence structures. Um, and so what I did was with, wasn't, so with my friend Francesco Pacifico, who's a novelist, but also a translator into English of many novels, um, we, this is actually where Skype works, that over Skype, we went through, I had the Italian text in front of me, and so actually, because of, I have Latin and French, so I could, it wasn't that I had no vague. I just wanted to talk. Yeah, so I could vaguely see what was a noun, as it were. Um, and he gave me, basically, we would just write a massive map of the thing, so he would say, and this is in Milanese, and this is very strange, and this sentence structure doesn't work, and you should really expect the verb here. So it was like the most extraordinary crit of this one story. Um, so it wasn't that he literally just gave me a literal version. It was, in fact, opposite to that. He, we together, because he speaks basically fluent English. It really is a dual translation um, that I then went away and kind of did various things. I would then send it to him. He would say, I think you've still got it wrong here because you haven't managed to get this effect. And um, Yeah, and that was really fascinating, actually, because I sort of feel that what we ended up with was quite a good translation mm. of Gather, um, if now wildly different, actually, in lots of respects from the original. Uh, I'm afraid it's half past three, uh, so we're done. Uh, we're going to go back in half an hour, going to go back upstairs to continue with that infinite sequence of minute decisions uh, <laughs> that I haven't talked about, which really is infinite and they really are minute. Um, so we're going to be going back to our workshop rooms in half an hour. We have a coffee break now. Before you go for a coffee break, please join me in thanking Tasha. And-